Good day and welcome back to tutorial number two. In this tutorial we're going to be discussing some of the basic electrical properties that you need to know. Those are current, voltage, resistance and charge. Current is measured in amperes and it's the flow of electricity, the flow of electrons. Voltage is measured in volts and voltage is the electrical pressure, the thing that makes electrons flow. Resistance is the opposition to that flow. The electrons in a conductor don't want to be moved and in order to move them we have to overcome their resistance to make them move. In doing so we produce heat. Resistance is the only electrical property that produces heat. So voltage current resistance, voltage is the pressure, current is the resulting flow from that pressure, resistance is the opposition to that flow, charge is the amount of displacement of electrons. So if you remove electrons from an object, uh, that object will become positively charged. The electrons you've removed are negative charge. It is the displacement, the separation of charge, the moving of electrons away from something that creates voltage. Electrical pressure is the displacement of charge. We'll go into that more in this tutorial. Let's just talk about atoms and molecules and materials for a moment. All materials are made up of atoms. There are over 100 types of different atoms. A material that is made of one type of atom is called an element. Some examples of elements are copper, zinc, carbon and iron. And as I said there are over a hundred different types. Materials that are made up of more than one atom uh, are called molecules. For example water is made up of the atoms hydrogen and oxygen, H2O is the chemical equation for water because it contains two atoms hydrogen and oxygen. What we're talking about here is not molecules but just atoms. Atoms are unique in that if you try to reduce an iron atom to be less than iron you will no longer have iron. On the screen I've got a picture of a generic atom just to give you an idea what it looks like or symbolically what it looks like. The atom has a nucleus. In the nucleus there are two basic subatomic particles. These are called the neutrons, they're shown in blue and protons which are shown in red. Protons have a positive charge and neutrons have no charge. We're not particularly interested in the neutrons. In fact we're not particularly interested in the protons because protons are very difficult to remove from the nucleus of the atom. In fact the nucleus of the atom is very difficult to do anything with. It takes a great deal of energy to release protons or neutrons from the nucleus of the atom. Surrounding the nucleus shown in black here and they're shown in orbits uh, we've got in this case we've got three electrons and they're shown in grey. Electrons are a negative charge and electrons have the same negative charge or the, op the same amount of charge as the proton. So for every proton in an atom there is an orbiting electron. So if you have three protons in an atom which are positively charged you have three orbiting electrons which are negatively charged. 
because the number of protons and electrons is the same, the net charge of the atom is neutral. The ch negative charge of the electrons precisely cancels out the positive charge of the protons. The atom then is uh, by itself neutral because for every electron which has a negative charge there is a proton which has a positive charge and those two charges cancel out so if you have one electron and one proton together you have no charge at all so in nature most electrons sorry most atoms in their normal state are neutral it's only when we start pulling away electrons from atoms that we create electrical pressure called voltage and electrons are attracted to protons and vice versa. So when we pull electrons away from an atom, the atom becomes positive, the electron is negative and they attract each other and the atom will pull its electrons back. How much separation of charge we have is, is measured in coulombs and if we were to pull away a charge of 6.25 by 10 to the 18th electrons we would have a charge of 1 coulomb that's 6.25 by 10 to the 18th electrons to get the real number that means you would have to write down 6.25 25 and then move the decimal place 18 places to the right and that's an extremely large number so it takes that many electrons to make a charge of one coulomb we're normally dealing with electrons in radio and communication because it's the electrons that do the moving protons even though they have the same charge there are two reasons why they're difficult to move Reason one is protons are locked into the nucleus of the atom. Very difficult to get out. It takes a nuclear reaction to get protons out of the nucleus of the atom. And the other thing is, in spite of being precisely the same charge as the electron, the proton has a mass nearly 1800 times more. So in electricity, it is the electrons which do the moving, not the protons. That's why we are studying electronics. Electronics is the study of electrons. Before we move away from this graphic of a, an atom, I'd like to point out, <clears throat> and you don't need to know this for your assessment, but it, it really is helpful in understanding basic electricity. If you were to forcefully remove electrons from an atom, and remember electrons are negative, if you were to force uh, electrons to be taken away from an atom, that would leave the atom positive. Now an atom which is positive is called a positive ion, I-O-N, India, Oscar, November. An atom which has lost electrons is called a positive ion. If somehow we were able to um, put extra electrons onto an atom, then the atom would be negative and it would be called a negative ion. So a positive ion is an atom which has lost electrons. Uh, that means a displacement of charge, a separation of charge, because we've pulled electrons away, and that's what creates voltage, electrical pressure. And if an atom was uh, lacking electrons, it would be a positive ion. If an atom had more electrons than it needed, it would be called a negative ion. But just talking about these words negative and positive for a moment they're just names they're names that Benjamin Franklin gave to uh, electricity he had to 
provide a name for the charge which describes the behaviour of an electron and he had to think of a name for the proton although he didn't do any work with protons there in the nucleus we only did that much later in the early um, 20th century um, protons are positive and he gave he gave them the names negative and positive the names in themselves do not mean anything we could have just as easily called the charge of an electron a white charge and we could have called the charge of the proton a black charge. They're just names because electrons and protons behave differently we need to talk about the type of charge we're talking about. The thing is about charge um, like charges repel each other so electrons would repel each other and unlike charges attract each other so positive and negative would attract two negatives would repel two positives would repel it's when we pull electrons away from an atom that we create a displacement or separation of charges. When we pull electrons away from an atom, the atom is left with a positive charge, the electrons we pulled away are negative charge, and there is an attractive force now between the negative charge and the positive charge, and if possible, the negative charge will flow back to the atom making the atom neutral again. It is this flow of electrons back to the positively charged atom that we commonly refer to as electric current or just electricity. So remember please if you will the law of charges. Like charges repel and unlike charges attract. Electrons repel electrons, protons repel protons, and electrons are attracted to protons, unlike charges attract. We very rarely will never in electronics deal with the movement of protons unless we're dealing with special currents through a liquid. In order to release the protons from the nucleus of the atom, we would have to split the nucleus of the atom open. Uh, such a process is called nuclear fission, and it takes a great deal of energy to do that. The nucleus of the atom is very, very hard to get to. Uh, just to explain why, we, we, I've said that uh, positive charges repel, well here we are we've got a nucleus with lots of positive protons in it you would expect the nucleus to blow itself apart because of the repulsion between each other of all the protons that doesn't happen because there's a force in the nucleus of the atom called the strong nuclear force and it holds the nucleus of the atom together it's the strong nuclear force that is released in a fission bomb or an atom bomb and when you break that nucleus apart that energy the strong nuclear force is the energy that's released in nuclear fission now you might think it's difficult to remove electrons from an atom when in fact it, it really is quite easy and there are a number of ways of doing it and you don't need to remember these for assessment but just to give you an idea one of the the easiest ways is to re to remove electrons from an atom is just to use friction uh, for example uh, when a woman combs her hair with a brush uh, quite often her hair will follow the brush through the air the reason why that happens is because the act of brushing your hair strips electrons away uh, from your hair and attaches them to the comb so the comb becomes negatively charged your hair is positively charged and therefore the hair is attracted to the comb but there are many other ways of removing electrons from atoms uh, because we're trying to produce electricity and remember electricity is the act 
of electrons going back to a positive atom. The movement of electrons is what we call electric current. The number of ways are we can do it with friction, uh, that you're familiar with because you're familiar with static electricity. Uh, there's chemical, we could use a chemical reaction uh, to remove electrons from an atom. That's what we do in a battery. And the other major way is we can use an external magnetic field or magnet if you like to make to pull electrons away from an atom. A magnetic field has an influence on electrons and the magnetic field can be used to pull electrons away from an atom leaving the atom a positive ion. Uh, there are other uh, other ways, but they're the three main ones. There's something called the piezoelectric effect. Uh, these are special materials. Uh, there's about a hundred of them. Um, and if you compress these materials, they produce a voltage. And if you put a voltage on these materials, they the material will twist. That's called the piezoelectric effect. But that's about all. That, that's, you don't need to know that for assessment, uh, but that's just a little bit of background for you. All of electronics is removing electrons from atoms and making them do things for us. That's what electricity and radio communications really is. As I mentioned before, <coughs> there are... Uh, around about 118, I said over 100, there's about 118 different types of elements and the elements are shown in the periodic table. You do not need to have a knowledge of this, but it's a good idea to know of the existence of the periodic table. Elements that, and, and what the periodic table shows you is all of the elements. At the moment I've moused over Element number 29, Cu, and that's the copper atom. Element number 30 is zinc. And element number 26 is iron. Electrons are easily removed from metals. For that reason, metals are conductors of electricity because their outer electrons, not so much the inner ones close to the nucleus of the atom, but the outer electrons are easy to remove from the atom. So such elements are referred to as conductors uh, and most metals are good conductors. Conduct uh, materials which do not conduct electricity well that is, it's difficult to remove the electrons from them, either chemically or by friction or using Faraday's law and magnetism. Elements that do not allow their electrons to be removed easy are called insulators. There's another group of materials which uh, we'll be talking about later, and they're part way between insulators and conductors. Conductors conduct electricity well, insulators do not. There's another group called semiconductors, and they're neither poor, uh, sorry, they're neither good conductors or good insulators. They're semiconductors. They could have just as easily been called uh, semi insulators. Um, but all metals are good conductors. Uh, examples of insulators would be glass, which is not an element. It's a variation of an element, so it's uh, silicon. And, and I didn't mention either, by the way, that uh, germanium and silicon are, are the most popular types of semiconductors. But rubber, glass, porcelain, uh, plastics, uh, most of those are good insulators and most metals are good conductors. I will mention something about uh, conductors. Uh, all metals, copper, zinc, brass. The best, inch, uh, best conductors are silver and gold, but they're a little bit too expensive. Copper is a very common uh, conductor. It's a good conductor. Um, aluminium is, though, by far the most abundant conductor we use. Uh, telephone cables, power lines, 
are made from aluminium. Aluminium is not as good a conductor as copper. However, aluminium is cheaper than copper. It's corrosion resistant. It's not as ductile, which means it doesn't stretch as much. And it's lighter. Uh, so, in spite of being not as good a conductor as copper, aluminium is the conductor of preferred choice in most applications outside radio power line distribution and telephone cables and so forth. What I've put up on the monitor now is some red circles and some blue circles. The blue circles represent electrons which can be moved. The red circles represent protons which are in the nucleus of an atom and they cannot be moved. So what we're looking at is a material and we're illustrating the protons in the nucleus that can't be moved and the outer electrons of the material which can be moved by chemically friction or a magnetic field, Faraday's law. Any material in its normal state has an equal number of protons and electrons so the charge of this material and, and all materials unless they're modified in some way the charge of all of this is neutral. In order to make electricity we have to move electrons away from this material. Suppose, by any means I like, I were to grab hold of one of these electrons and remove it from the material. There we are. So I've placed a negative electron here. So that means this area here is now negatively charged. That could be another material with, with protons and neutrons, but I'm just going to have a sole electron out there. But that means that over here we have a negative charge. Because I've created a negative charge here, I've created a positive charge here. Because we now have an imbalance of charge. We only have five electrons and we have six protons. So this now has a positive charge equal to one proton. And what I've created between the left hand side and the right hand side is an imbalance of charge. We have positive charge here, we have negative charge there. That's an imbalance of charge. There is now a force pulling this electron back to this atom. Positive attracts negative. So because we've pulled it away, the negative electron is now attracted back to this positive material. I can increase the amount of that attractiveness by removing more electrons. So I'll take another one. We've now got more pressure pulling. This is more positive, this is more negative, and there's now more pull on these two electrons back to this atomic material. And the more I do that, the greater that pressure will be. So I'm creating a great electrical pressure here between the negative electrons and this positive material. And if I continue to take electrons out, that pressure becomes greater and greater and greater for these electrons to travel back to the positive material. If I were to continue to move negative electrons from this material, I would increase this force field. By the way, it's called an electric force field. I would increase the strength of this force field. I'd increase the pressure for these electrons to get back to the positive material. Let's just take another one out. So what I'm creating here on the right hand side is a very negative charge and what I'm leaving behind is an equal positive charge uh, in the material. These would be positive ions, these would be negative electrons. 
This force that I'm creating between the two imbalances of charge, and it's an imbalance of charge whenever you don't have two things that are neutral, you have an imbalance of charge between them. But there's a name for this force trying to pull the electrons back, and the name for that force is voltage. So voltage is the force created when you pull electrons away from a material. The force trying to get those electrons to travel back to the material is called voltage. And the greater the disassociation or imbalance of charge, the greater that pressure or voltage is. A be the best way to think about voltage is electrical pressure and the purpose of electrical pressure or what we use electrical pressure for is to move electrons. So the left hand side is positive, the right hand side is negative. If we want those negative electrons to flow easily back to the positive left hand side, we need to place between the two a conductor. Just one more thing. If I kept pulling electrons out, let's say I had an unending supply, and I don't, I've only got two left. If I had an en uh, unending supply of electrons and I continued to pull electrons out, until I've pulled out altogether 6.25 by 10 to the power 18, if I pull out that many electrons, I will have one coulomb of charge. So if you have 6.25 by 10 to the 18th electrons here, then you have one coulomb of charge. Uh, the symbol for a coulomb is, is the letter Q. You won't be needing to use it in your standard amateur radio exam. So a coulomb is an awful lot of electrons, but a coulomb is a unit that we use to define other units, so you pay, it pays you to know about it, but you're not going to be tested on it. Let's get back to how we're going to allow these electrons to get back to the positive material on the left hand side. We are going to need a conductor, something that electrons can flow through easily to allow them to get back, and of course that will be a conductor and the best conductors are metals. Now I've placed a couple of rolls of copper wire between our two charges. If I were to connect a piece of that wire between the positive charge on the left and the negative charge on the right then that electrical pressure would cause the electrons on the right to flow from atom to atom through the copper material to the positive charge on the left hand side. Any conductor would do that and just about any metal is a good conductor. And in the graphic below I've shown how the electrons would go into the wire and then travel through the wire by going from atom to atom. So this would be the negative end. Electrons are going in and going from atom and atom to atom to the positive side. So if we were to connect a conductor between the negative right side and the positive left side, there would be a flow of electrons from the negative side to the positive side because of the electrical pressure, the, the voltage that exists between them. When we have a flow of electrons from negative to positive through a conductor, that is called electric current. And electric current is measured in amperes. So here we have a flow of electrons caused by voltage 
through a conductor. So electrons, negative electrons pushed by voltage flow through a conductor to the positive side. That is called electric current. An electric current always flows from negative to positive. We normally just call it current flow or current. Current is measured in amperes, A-M-P-E-R-E-S, amperes. Voltage is measured in volts. And if we have one, if we have that many electrons flowing per second, if we have 6.25 by 10 to the 18th electrons flowing per second, from negative to positive, we have one ampere. That is the definition of one ampere. One coulomb of electrons per second, or one coulomb of charge per second, is equal to an electric current of one ampere. If I were to place a material between the two charges, which was not a conductor, then if it was a very good insulator, no electrons would flow from negative to positive. If I was to use a material that wasn't a good a conductor as copper, for example, iron doesn't conduct electrons as well as copper, then the amount of electrons flowing from negative to positive would be less than if I used copper. The reason being is copper has more resistance to the flow of electrons than, sorry, iron has more resistance to the flow of electrons than copper does. So different materials are able to conduct electricity to a, a greater or lesser extent. It is the resistance of the material that will determine how much current flows, as well as the amount of voltage we have. So the more resistance, the less the current flow. The less the resistance, the greater the current flow. The higher the voltage or electrical pressure, the greater the current flow. The lower the voltage or electrical pressure, the lower the current flow. That's the beginnings of Ohm's law. What I've drawn here is an analogy between a water system and an electrical system. On the left hand side we've got a water tank on a stand. There's air pressure bearing down on the water, that's the weight of the atmosphere. And that water pressure, that air pressure I'm sorry, will cause water to flow through the pipe and out the end of the pipe if the tap is open. The size of the pipe will govern how much water flows and the air pressure will govern how much water flows. The size of the pipe is changed by adjusting the tap. So if we want a very small type pipe, we turn the tap in. If we want a larger pipe, we turn the tap out. Compare that to an electrical system. Here we have an electrical circuit. There's a source of voltage. Uh, negative will be at the top, positive will be at the bottom. I know that because current is flowing in a clockwise direction as shown by this arrow. So current flows from negative to positive through the, through the resistor. That's a symbol for resistance. Current flows from negative to positive through the resistance and back to the source of supply. So current is flowing in a clockwise direction. The opposition to current flow is the resistance of the circuit. Let's compare the two systems. Air pressure in a water system is like the voltage in an electrical system. The more air pressure we have, the greater the flow of water. The more voltage we have, the greater the flow of electric current. The other thing that determines how much current flows is the friction in a water system and that's the same as the resistance 
in an electrical system. Resistance is measured in ohms and the more ohms of resistance we have, the greater the ohms of resistance, the less current flow. So you can see they're pretty much the same sort of thing and, and that's how you should think of voltage. You think, should think of voltage as pressure. Pressure doesn't go anywhere. Pressure causes something to move. In the electrical circuit, the electrical pressure causes electrons to move from atom to atom through the wire from negative around to positive and that's a continuous flow in a circuit. In the water system it's air pressure that causes the water to be forced out of the pipe and, and flow. The size of the pipe controlled by the tap also controls the amount of flow. The bigger the pipe the more open the tap the more the flow. The greater the air pressure the more the flow. In an electrical system the greater the voltage the greater the flow. The lower the voltage the less the flow. In fact they're a direct proportion. What that means is that if we double the air pressure we will double the flow of water. If we double the electrical voltage, the electrical pressure, if we double it that will double the current flow. The thing working against flow in both systems is friction and resistance. If we were to double the friction we would halve the amount of water flowing. If we were to double the amount of electrical resistance we would halve the amount of current flowing. When current flows through any conductor, because all conductors have resistance, heat is given off and, and, and we measure that in power and the unit of power is the watt. And I've shown that these arrows here to indicate that heat is being given off from the resistor. That's power and it's measured in watts. So I hope you can see the the analogy between the two there. There's a real handy way of remembering the relationship between voltage, current and resistance and how they and how they work together. The proper name for current is the unit of current is the ampere and we often just abbreviate that to amps and it's the voltage that pushes the current through the resistance. It's the air pressure that pushes the water through the friction of the pipe. So we can make the following statement. It volts push amps through ohms. Good idea if you remember that. Volts push amps through ohms. It's the voltage, the electrical pressure, that is producing, pushing the current, the amperes, through the resistance of this circuit. And remember, just to get one ampere, we need to be pushing through this electrical circuit 6.25 by 10 to the 18th electrons per second past a given point. That quantity of electrons is also called a coulomb the unit of charge, symbol Q, we could say that one coulomb per second past a, past a given point is equal to one ampere. Just to show you another example, here we have on the left an electrical system, on the right a water system. Same as before, just drawn a different way. Here we have a water pump, a turbine pump and we, ha we can control the speed of it. Let's just click on high and it goes much faster. So what we've done is we've increased the speed of the pump and we've also increased the voltage. So at high pump pressure and high voltage we've got a, a much greater flow of electrical current in the electrical circuit 
and we also have a much greater flow of water in the water circuit. In the electrical circuit, in this case, the current is flowing through the filament of a light bulb, which is just a resistance, and that filament is getting hot because current flow causes conductors to get hot, but the filament of the light bulb gets extremely hot, so hot that it glows white hot and then incandesces and radiates light. So it's voltage that's pushing current through resistance. And in the water system, it's the pressure of the pump that's pushing water through the circuit. And the opposition to current flow in this circuit is the size of the pipe, the friction of the two pipes. The opposition in the electrical circuit is the electric light bulb. Let's just go back to, to low again. We reduce the voltage and we reduce the pump pressure. We now have a fl lower flow of rate of current through the electrical circuit. The light bulb is dimmer and we have a slower rate of water through the water system as well. Well, thank you for listening to tutorial number two. I look forward to seeing you again. Please remember there is drill software that you can use to test yourself uh, using multiple choice questions on these tutorials. And you should be trying to achieve as high a score as possible in those drills. And if you find you're not, perhaps it's time to come back and look at the tutorial again before proceeding with the drill. Look forward to seeing you next time. This is Ron VK2DQ for the Radio and Electronics School.